All right, so we are in 2 Timothy chapter 2, if you're already there. Uh, good job. If not, go ahead and grab your Bibles and, or pull out your apps. We'll be 2 Timothy chapter 2. And so we're going to continue on in our study as we're walking through the book of 2 Timothy. And if you've been with us, or if this is your first time, just as a, as a reminder, uh, the book of 2 Timothy is a book written by, or a letter written by the Apostle Paul that he sends to his young disciple, his young mentee, Timothy. Uh, Timothy is a pastor at a church in Ephesus, a pluralistic society, uh, competing worldviews. Uh, it wasn't necessarily a beacon of Christianity uh, where Timothy was. And Timothy was uh, a younger man and was learning and what it looked like to minister faithfully in this city and in this place and in this church. And Paul is writing him this letter to encourage him to persevere, to keep going, uh, to keep on keeping on and remain faithful to Jesus Christ despite all the different trials and circumstances that are presenting before him. Paul essentially towards the latter half of the letter, as we'll look at in a few weeks, is that he's referencing his own life as well, saying that he has ran the race and he's pouring out his life for Timothy and them to follow and model after because Paul knows that he's about to die. As he's writing this letter, he's in a Roman prison cell and he's just sending these words of encouragement to Timothy and to us with his final charge to persevere, to stay on course. Uh, we saw in the first few weeks that Paul is telling Timothy, and he would invite us as well, that we don't have to be fearful, that we don't have to be timid, that we don't have to be ashamed of the gospel message in which we received in forgiveness in Jesus Christ. Uh, he's called us to endure uh, whatever God may throw at us, that we would entrust this gospel message to others. And even last week when Bruce was teaching for us that we are to pursue being honorable vessels for God's use to advance the kingdom and to proclaim the good news of Christ. And so this morning, as we dig into the, the verses that Susie just read for us, it's really helpful to consider what, how this actually plays itself out for our day-to-day -day lives. Now, sometimes we come to church and we think, well, I'm going to hear a good message or I'm going to be encouraged, I'm going to be inspired, and hopefully that's true. Uh, but ultimately, our time together when we explore the scriptures is not just a matter of time of exploring the scriptures to see what it has to say, but allowing the word of God and allowing the spirit to God to examine us as well to make us more and more like our Savior, Right? Like, I hope that when we come here on Sunday, we're almost expecting to hear from God, and maybe there might be a tinge of conviction of maybe where we've missed the mark, or maybe an encouragement of saying, hey, I am on the right path, and God is at work in me. So our hope is that as we explore this passage this morning, it might actually encourage us in the way that we've been interacting with others, or maybe it would even challenge us a little bit of how we engage in conversation and carry ourselves when we have conversations with people who aren't believers, because uh, believe it or not, you are a minority here in Clark County. Now, when I say that, I mean when you go to the grocery store later, like you're going to go to Fred Meyer, you're going to go to Safeway, or if you're going to Costco, may God's mercy be on you on a Sunday, you are in the minority in the sense that you are somebody who identifies as a follower of Jesus. Not a whole lot of people in the Pacific Northwest in 2024 would proudly carry the Jesus flag, right? Say that I'm a follower of his, that I've been redeemed by him, that I've been forgiven by him, that I wanna live a life for him. So simply by stating that fact, if that's true about you, you're in a minority, so you know when you go to your workplace at times, or when you go interact in your hobbies, or you have interactions throughout the culture and in the society, you often come into con uh, conflict with others because they have a competing worldview or a competing sets of beliefs. Now, when we have an interaction with somebody who's like that, we have a couple different options of how we would proceed in our interactions and how we proceed in our language. And this passage this morning helps maybe correct us or encourage us of how we carry ourselves and conduct ourselves in these conversations. And so I think today's text is extremely applicable for all of us. And so the main idea that we're gonna walk through today with a couple supporting points is this, is that repentance always leads to the right path. Now, repentance always leading to the right path, is simply trying to boil down the idea is that repenting, turning from sin or turning from worship of self or love of self or love of this world and turning towards God is always going to lead us down a right path. And we're gonna see that through this passage. Um, and it's one decision or one action that we just don't do one time in the past, like, hey, I repented 10 years ago, I'm good. No, you're not, you need to repent every single day. Because until Christ calls us home or we're with him, there's still warring desires within inside of us. And we'll see that as we walk through this passage. Um, and so we'll, we're gonna start with asking ourselves a question of, the uh, question is not if you are running, but where are you going? We're all headed in some destination towards something. 
And then we're going to study the lifestyle of the repentant, of what the scriptures would say a, a person who's a follower of Jesus, a repentant person looks like. And then lastly, we're going to look at and see how repentant people bring others along with them. And so that's where we're going. Let me pray for us and we'll jump in. Father, we give you thanks for this morning and just the opportunity and the blessing that it's been to, uh, to greet one another, to wake up with air in our lungs and uh, an invitation to sing about the goodness of God, an invitation to recite scripture with one another, to remind one another of these truths or maybe even be introduced to these truths for the first time. And Father, we pray that as we spend time in these next few moments examining your scripture, uh, would your spirit examine us? Will this word be uh, a mirror to us of where uh, we fall short or we're misaligned with what we would have for us? But ultimately, we also ask that uh, as the text talks about repentance, would you give us a humility that we'd be willing to repent ourselves? So we pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear and a receptivity towards the gospel message this morning. We pray this all in Jesus' name. All God's people said, amen. So the question is not if you are running, but where are you going? Paul says in verse 22, says this, so flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. The very beginning of verse 22, Paul says, so flee youthful passions, uh, meaning kind of connecting his argument that he's about to make right here with what was taught on last week when Bruce was talking and teaching about what it means to be an honorable vessel for God, somebody who's been set apart, somebody who's holy, and somebody who's useful to the master, somebody who'd be an honorable vessel. So he's taking that whole argument of, if this is what you're wanting to do, how exactly do we do that? He continues on in the argument here in 22, saying, if you wanna be honorable vessel, useful for the master, ready for every good work, Flee youthful passions. Flee youthful passions. Now, this passage is really encouraging for me this week because as Bruce was talking last week saying, if you want to be ready for every good work, I actually left last Sunday thinking about how often am I actually ready to do that? oftentimes I think life is a matter of circumstances that happen at a random will, right? Like I just find myself in different circumstances in different situations and I, I need to respond in the moment to it. But what last week's passage asked us and encouraged us to do is actually, hey, be ready in every situation to do every good work that God presents before you. And so this week, I was just simply thinking through, how can I be ready to step into whatever God has prepared for me? And then as I began studying this passage, I saw immediately, quickly, it's, it's not necessarily a, a posture of like ready to jump into it, but it's actually where my mind and my heart is ready to jump into so my heart is gonna to wanna to go somewhere, my mind's gonna to wanna to go somewhere, my actions are gonna to go somewhere. I have one of two options here. I either can go after youthful passions or pursue what is right. And Paul calls us to flee youthful passions, to flee from these things. Uh, the word flee, the, um, the root word, is the same word where we get fugitive. So think Harrison Ford, running, searching for the one-armed man, right? But the word fugitive is simply asking us to seek safety or seeking escape. So there, there is a sense when we consider our spiritual walk, when we look at our spiritual transformation and our growth in Christ, we are to flee certain things and to pursue other things. And yet, even right then there, we quickly find ourselves getting caught, right? You know, in the early 2000s, there was this whole uh, policy of like, we don't negotiate with terrorists, right? Right? I sometimes think that we often flirt with sin. That we, we often negotiate with the youthful passions and desires in our life. That we often want to play footsie with sin. We allow it to lull it in, us in and draw us in. And we pursue those things. We, we run after those things. Now, we, we quickly want to run to external moralistic behaviors when we see the words youthful passions, Right? We think of elsewhere in the scripture where it talks about fleeing sexual immorality, for example. We think of stories like Joseph and Potiphar's wife. We think of different stories of how we maybe with lust or maybe our anger or rebellion of those youthful passions and desires. And honestly, those are ones that we should run from. 
But the ones that Paul is talking about in this passage are a little bit harder because they actually do a whole lot more with our posture towards God and towards other people. And it's a little bit harder to delineate at times. Because notice what he says to flee, starting in verse 23. He says, have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. So the very first thing that he gives as an illustration of a youthful passion or desire is engaging in and participating in or pursuing foolish, ignorant controversies. This isn't the only time that Paul warns Timothy and elsewhere in his pastoral letters where he warns God's people not to get involved with this type of behavior and this demeanor. Multiple times Paul calls us to not get involved in disputes or controversies. And I feel like that's quite telling, isn't it? Like it's one thing if I tell you something one time, you're like, okay, that must be really important. But if I come to you time and time and time and time again about one thing in particular, you would begin to think about like, hey, that must be really important, right? So when Paul tells Timothy and elsewhere in the New Testament to avoid foolish, ignorant controversies, that must mean that you and I have the propensity to do what? Engage in foolish, ignorant controversies. And part of that is, I think it's because we love to fight. Not necessarily in a physical sense, but we love to spar intellectually. We love to get into different debates and we love to argue over finer points of different things. Part of it is, uh, you know, I know somebody who just loved to fight because they felt a connection with people and they did it. They're like, it, like, did your mother not hug you enough growing up? Like, do you need connection through fighting? That's a silly thing. But there is, we, we sometimes engage in these conflicts and these, these types of behaviors because we want some type of connection with individuals, but then ultimately it leads us nowhere. So Paul tells us to avoid stupid and senseless controversies. Warns us against it to flee from them, to run from them. Because within our own devices, we often love to pursue fights or pursue uh, debates in an unhealthy and unhelpful manner. What Paul is warning at here is somebody who loves to spoil for a fight, meaning that they're engaged in such a way that they're always prepared and always ready to fight whether there's an immediate readiness or they're looking for different opportunities to do just so. Now, uh, one way is that this passage has been helpful in my life uh, and think about it is because typically I am somebody who would, who would love to have the intellectual jousting match, right? But sometimes it's not always the most helpful, nor is it the most appropriate. So for example, a handful of years ago, I was still uh, pastoring down in Reno, Nevada, a real haven for Christianity, right? Everybody, everybody there is Christian, right? Um, but we were walking through a sermon series uh, looking at sexuality. And we were looking at how God has designed gender, how God has taught uh, what he wants for marriage relationships, uh, what, what parenting looks like. We, we looked at the whole gamut of things. And obviously, no one in the culture right now has anything to say about sexuality and gender, right? Like, that's not, nobody talks about that, right? Oh, wait, everybody's got an opinion on it. So we, we, we took a series in which we were just faithfully just trying to look at the scriptures and see what God says about gender, what it says about sexuality, what it says about marriage, all those things. And we were wanting to have an honest, good forth conversation and just ex simply exploring what the, what the scriptures had to say about it. Um, however, when you do that, what often happens? People take to the blog. People take to the internet and then begin to slander or critique or condemn and want to just throw emails at you, right? And obviously, to some degree, that's going to happen regardless of what you say from a Christian standpoint. Uh, and to some degree, if you're here this morning and you're wrestling with Christianity and what the Bible has to say with those things, don't hear me saying that we're not open to conversations on that because we are. But what we're not interested in is if you just simply have an ax to grind and you want to fight over it. So what was happening is there was this one individual in the community who had, had a ministry of just like critiquing and tearing down churches that would begin to have these conversations around gender and sexuality and marriage. Um, in fact, in one of the interactions that we had through an email, the person said, I'm going to call you out with any public megaphone I have. And was, and was baiting us to trying to get in these conversations, saying, hey, let's get the media crew. Let's do all these things, wanting to make a huge scene out of this whole conversation. And it was clear that their intentions weren't what were good. And so uh, one of the older, more wiser individuals in the room decided we should just put, nip this in the bud and put this to stop together altogether. So we wrote this email in response to this woman saying, as such, since your tone and your tenor of your emails clearly indicate that you're hostile towards the church, more to the point that you're spoiling for a fight, 
we will respectfully decline your invitation based on our reading of 2 Timothy 2, 23 through 26. Sincerely, blank. And you know what? She never responded. We had enough conviction and it's like, we, we will have conversations, we'll engage in these things, but we're not just simply going to fight and argue over these things because uh, there will always be people who want to bait us into gotcha games. And Paul is telling Timothy, Paul is telling us not to fall victim to playing in those games. I love how George Bernard Shaw also said was, uh, never wrestle with pigs. You both get dirty and the pig likes it. All right? So when I, don't hear me saying that we, we're not open to conversation and we're not open to having healthy, honest conversation, but we're not gonna just get into like foolish, ignorant arguments over silly things. Like we're not gonna put our breath towards that because sometimes I feel like we're far more known what we're against than rather what we're for. And oftentimes when we get into those arguments and those debates, they, they, people only hear what we're against, not what we're actually for. Because Paul goes on to tell Timothy in verse 24, he says this, the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome so he, he warns on one hand, don't walk into foolish controversies. Don't, 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 don't take the bait. Don't, don't, don't get invited in and don't play. But then he also says, don't be the one who creates them. Don't be quarrelsome. You know, some of us are habitual line steppers and perpetual pot stirrers. We just love to cause a little bit of chaos or love, love, love the sport of it. And Paul's saying, we must not be like that. Because notice what he anchors that in as the Lord's servants. Meaning that if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you're somebody who's been purchased and redeemed and forgiven by the work of Christ on the cross, that means that we are his servant, that we take our cues from him. He has the authority, he has the command, he has the power to lead and guide us in our lives, that we listen to him as his servants. So we wanna be individuals that are going to speak unkind or being harsh or simply make, engage in arguments to prove a point. The Lord's servant is somebody who should never just shoot from the hip or shoot from the lip with the idea of, you know, ready, fire, aim with our words. We're his servants and we follow and listen to what he has to say. And so immediately, if we go back to the question that we first posed with his, if, it's not if we are running, but where are, you, where are you running? So are you currently fleeing anything that would be catching you up in this? And, and you know, it was really funny. I didn't even think about this until after last service. Somebody came up to me afterwards and said, hey, thank you for having this message at this time because I feel like we are gonna get baited into a lot of stupid arguments in the next six months. I was like, I didn't even think about that. But it's true. We're gonna get tempted and baited to be engaging in the most ridiculous of conversations and arguments in the next six months. Maybe this passage is one that is perfectly timed for this point of the year to get us ready for what might be coming next. And so Paul says, flee from youthful passions and desires, foolish, ignorant controversies. But then look back with me in verse 22. He says, pursue some things. And so we actually see what the lifestyle of the repentant looks like, starting in verse 22. He says, pursue righteousness, faith and love and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. And then jump down to verse 24. The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome and kind, but kind to everyone, able to teach patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. So Paul is saying, you're, you're going to be pursuing something one other way. You're going to be running after something. You're either going to be running towards youthful desires, but he says, no, 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 flee from those and pursue righteousness. Pursue faith, pursue love, pursue peace, meaning that you're going to run towards it with arms wide open, trying to grasp it and get a hold of it. Going after those things, not youthful passions. The, the word that Paul uses here when he says pursue righteousness, pursue faith, pursue love, pursue peace, he's using the same word that he used when he described the way that he pursued the early church, trying to stamp it out before he was a believer. So that talks about just how aggressively Paul wants us to go after these things. Meaning that it doesn't naturally come easy for us. Paul's calling us to pursue these things. And so when we're looking at this passage, it, it gives us the idea of repentance. Repentance. Again, repentance is the idea of doing a complete 180 and turning from sin, turning towards God, right? And, and, and I don't know why this, way, this side is always the sin side. When we have this, this, the righteousness and sin, like the repentance, so like this side, there must be something wrong with you guys, I guess. All right. And this side, 
Praise God, I guess, you know? Like there, there, there is a sense of where we are always perpetually going to be running towards and chasing after something and that often isn't Christ, it isn't towards God. We're often seeking to build our own kingdoms, our own desires, whatever feels good, looks good, do it now. That's often what our heart wants and we wanna do that. But a lifestyle of repentance is constantly turning from them and saying, God, I trust in you that your way is better. I'm gonna listen for you, I'm gonna follow after you and I'm gonna humbly submit myself to you. So we, we flee from the sin or the youthful desires, but we also need to run towards something. Because I think sometimes, again, people know Christianity and Christians more for what they're against than what they're for. And so Paul sells us to pursue righteousness. So the very first thing that we have to think about when we consider our righteousness is that we need to understand that righteousness is a conduct which pleases God. But as Christians, we must understand that righteousness is right standing with God and we don't create that ourselves and we don't earn that ourselves. That our right standing with God is solely based upon the work that Christ has done for us, right? That's what Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians, for he who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. I don't get into God's good standing good graces by my own works or by my own efforts. It's a gift from God towards me something that he's accomplished for me through Christ on the cross. That's what he went to the cross for, to take my sin, the punishment that I deserved, the wrath that was coming towards me. Christ took that on joyfully and willfully for me and not only just made my slate clean, sometimes we think that, but he actually gives us his righteousness, his perfect standing with God. And so because of that, we now wanna pursue the things that are gonna bring honor and glory and worship and praise towards God. Because God and Christ has done so much for us, we can't help but be drawn towards those things. So we pursue righteousness. And so this isn't a passage that talks about behavior modification of try harder or be better or act nice. It's about a life that has been renewed and changed by Christ and saying, I wanna pursue that at all costs because God has done, has given his all costs to bring me close to him. So we pursue right activity out of our right standing with God. We follow and live after what is taught and revealed to us in the scriptures. That's why I love in the Psalms when we often see David who wrote many of the Psalms that he says that he delights in the law, that he delights in doing God's will. He pursues righteousness. He pursues what is holy and beautiful and true and good. As God's people, we flee from things that take us away from God and pursue the things that would bring worship and praise to him. So we pursue righteousness, but we also pursue faith, meaning it's an active belief and trust in God's word and what God says. Faith is not just simply a feeling that we feel. It's something that is to be exercised, meaning we're going to pursue action and pursue activity that is over comfort and over preference because we're going to pursue what God's word has for us. So we pursue righteousness, we pursue faith, and then it says we pursue love, a self-sacrifice living for the good of others. Now, I know what some of you may be thinking. Kyle, I'm not a very loving person. And I'd say, neither am I. But you know what this passage says to us? Too bad because it says pursue love, meaning that it's not gonna come easy, that it is gonna be challenging, it is gonna be hard, it is gonna be outside of us, but that doesn't mean the passage doesn't call us to it. It doesn't mean that God isn't calling his people to pursue this lifestyle to bring honor and praise to him by the way that we pursue loving one another, the way that we love those outside of the faith, the love of those that we come into contact with. Early church father Tertullian says this, it is our care for the helpless, our practicing of loving kindness that brands us in the eyes of many of our opponents. They themselves are being, they say, look how they love one another. They themselves being given to mutual hatred. Look how they are prepared to die for one another, yet they themselves being readier to kill each other. So we pursue righteousness, we pursue faith, we pursue love, and then it says we pursue peace meaning that's what binds us all together. God has made peace with us through the death of Christ on the cross, and this peace brings us harmony between us and God, but then it also brings us harmony with one another. 
We are to live and experience this with one another. And so it would, it would be such an interesting experiment this week. Here's where I put my sociologist hat on. Like, what would it look like for us as a church body this week, first week of May, 2024, starting on Cinco de Mayo, up until May 12th, Mother's Day next week, hint, hint, make sure you have your gifts for your mothers next week, right? But what would it look like if we woke up this mor- in the mornings and then when we checked in with our life groups later this week or had conversations with brothers and sisters in the faith and we just simply had the conversation of saying, hey, how did you pursue f- righteousness this week? How did you pursue faith? Who did you pursue in love because of what the, what the passage taught us to this week? Could you imagine if that was the first thing that kind of came through our, our brains this morning when we woke up the morning saying that I'm going to pursue these things because this is what the scripture was calling me to this week rather than waking up and thinking about like what did the knucklehead say on the news yesterday or waking up and thinking like I can't believe I have to go see that person later today like work's gonna be a drag. Whatever thought else that goes through your mind, what would it look like just for one week if we said verse 22 is gonna be the first question I ask of myself. How can I pursue righteousness? How can I pursue faith? How can I pursue love? How can I pursue peace this week? Could you imagine how radically different our church body would look like and how our community would look if God's people stepped into that? Because that's the lifestyle of the repentant. People who pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. And then, and then Paul winds down his argument as an encouragement to Timothy saying, by doing that, repentant people, people who live this way, actually bring others along with them. Others, he, uh, repentant people bring others along with them. So he says at the end of verse 24, the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. I, I can't help but think of how much of an encouragement this must have been to Timothy. Timothy, you're, 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 you're struggling and persevering. You're having a hard time continuing on. You're having all the reasons right in front of your face of why you should give up and quit. You wake up and you're doubting it. You don't know from which way to go forward. But you know what? Pursue these things. And then the next thing he says, patiently endure. Now, those two words are an interesting concept, right? Right? and almost seems a little redundant, doesn't it? Patiently endure. It, it's almost like if I were to say like, hey, in past history, like there's not modern history. Or if I were to say, hey, we've, we met with an unexpected surprise, like there's no expected surprise, then that would cease it's no longer a surprise, right? Or close proximity. So there's this, these, this coupling of these words just to kind of help anchor into the point of what exactly Paul is asking Timothy and us to do. Patiently endure evil. Correct opponents with gentleness. Notice how he doesn't tell Timothy to shy away. See, when we, when we, we meet opponents, I love the word that it ha- in the passage that it says uh, correcting his opponents. So it's not as if you will have opponents, you will have opponents. And we, uh, there's, I guess there's three ways of responding. There's one way of like responding with a sledgehammer and just trying to destroy them. That's not what this passage is calling for. He doesn't tell Timothy like, hey, stick your head in the sand like an ostrich and ignore them. He doesn't say that also. He says, don't clog your ears, don't close your eyes, be actively present and use your words to gently correct. He says, use your words to give grace. Use your words to speak truth. Notice he does say correct opponents. He doesn't say just ignore them. And again, that had to be such an encouragement for Timothy, somebody who we know who was timid, somebody who was so quickly to shy away. Paul is encouraging him saying, hey, you have the truth within you. You need to say something, but say it with gentleness. You will need to correct your opponents, but do it with gentleness. He's calling us and encouraging us to speak with constructive and clarifying words rather than destructive and confusing words. He's asking us to use careful, intentional words rather than flippant ones. So notice how he says here, you need to be able to teach, patiently endure evil, and correct opponents with gentleness. But notice the reason as to why. He doesn't say correct opponents so you seem smarter, so you seem brighter, so you seem more awesome. No. 
He says, and it's not even for your sake of why you need to correct the opponents. Correct your opponents with gentleness because God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading them to the knowledge of truth. That God has given you these words, God has given you the story, God has given you these experiences to communicate the truths of the gospel of how God has created the heavens and the earth, the cosmos, and he created everything good. But sin quickly entered in the world that we, and sin that we love to pursue, sin that we love to participate in, that has separated us from the love of God. But rather than sitting distant and abstract in a way, God enters into human history to bring forgiveness and healing and restoration for every broken heart and every crushed soul. And the best way that he's put that on display is by what Christ has done on the cross for you and I. When Christ was put to the death on the cross, it was for our sin that we've actively chose to pursue and love and delight in rather than pursuing and delighting in God. And that, 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 that Savior, that Messiah who was hanged on a tree and killed for us was put into a tomb three days later to rise again, defeating sin, Satan, death, the wrath that we deserve, all left in the tomb and all who would believe in him have a righteousness and a newness of life and joy to pursue Christ-likeness for all eternity. You and I, if we're believers in Jesus Christ, we have been entrusted with that message to gently correct our opponents so that God may grant them to repentance and believe in those things to be true for them. God has given us this word to correct opponents with gentleness, to win souls, to turn people from sin to Christ. Just as you have turned from fleeing from youthful passions and desires to pursuing righteousness, God has given you the ability to speak, to use words to help people turn from pursuing youthful desires and passions to pursue Christ. You see, Charles Spurgeon in his book, The Soul Winner, says this. The best attraction is the gospel and its purity. The weapon in which the Lord conquers men is the truth it is in Jesus. The gospel will be found equal to every emergency, an arrow which can pierce the hardest heart and a balm which will heal the deadliest wound. What Spurgeon is saying here is this. The thing that is needed the most in your life and mine, in your neighbors, your coworkers, whoever you come into interaction with, the thing that they need the most is the gospel message of Jesus. And we might think, man, I don't know if that message is effective enough, but look what Spurgeon says. It is strong enough to pierce the hardest heart. And you know how I know that's true? Because the hardest heart that I have ever met was my own. Prideful, arrogant, self-serving, seeking my own desires and wants and wills, But when the message of the gospel came to me, it broke me. Crushed my hard heart. But that's the beautiful thing about the gospel message. It doesn't just come in and crush and destroy. Notice what Spurgeon said, that it will heal the deadliest wound. So if you're here this morning, crushed in spirit, brokenhearted, the thing that you need the most is to remind, be reminded of or be told maybe for the first time of what Christ has done for you. How the God is not angry and upset with you. How God has provided a way for you to be made at one with him. That whatever has separated you from the love of God is no longer there because Christ has stepped in to fill that gap. The gospel message can heal. It has and it will continue to do so. But we need to see, as, as Paul is telling Timothy here to correct his opponents in gentleness, he, you see, he isn't just necessarily speaking, hey, church leaders, make sure when you, you have these interactions and have these conversations, you're like this. This is an instruction for all of us, because even Paul says in this passage that says, the Lord's servant must be able to teach. And we think about Jesus' instruction in the Great Commission, go therefore and make disciples, giving to all of us. So all of us are called to do this, and Spurgeon picks up on this in that same book. He says, every man here, every woman here, Every child here whose heart is right with God may be a soul winner. So bringing others into faith and connection with God and relationship with Jesus Christ isn't just a person with a microphone's job for 30 minutes on a Sunday morning. It's for all of us. That you and I have been equipped with different words and experiences and backgrounds to connect with others, to bring correction gently to others when they have worldly, poorly misunderstood worldviews and beliefs about how the world works. 
I get it. Society at large is absolutely maddening for what is believed, what is taught, and what is promoted. But hear Paul's words again of what he would encourage us to do. Correct opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of truth. For why? Look at verse 26. They may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. So what what Paul is writing here and is saying is that everybody who's apart from Christ, who's not in a relationship with God, is actually intoxicated and captivated by the devil. That's the language that he's using here, that this word that where it says that they have been taken ensnared is the same word when they say captured. It's the same idea in which Jesus told Peter that you're gonna be a catcher of men, like you're hunting prey down and you're gonna collect them. That's what Peter, Paul is saying about everybody who's apart from Christ, they've been caught and ensnared by the evil one. They don't even know that they're caught. And in fact, when he talks about that they may come to their senses, it's saying that they're drunkenly intoxicated by the evil one. That there's this diabolical intoxication that keeps them from seeing the truth, that keeps them from seeing reality. And, and we know this to be true about this is the way that the evil one works, Right? We know that he loves to lie and deceive and twist and distort. Thomas Brooks, in his book called Precious Remedies Against Satan Devices, written in 1652, he talks about how one of Satan's biggest tactics to trick us and deceive us is to get us hooked without even realizing that we're hooked. Now, I am not a fisherman. I will gladly become one if you want to teach me. But I, I do have some understandings of how fishing works, right? You go out with a fishing rod. And what do you put at the end of your line? A hook. Starts with a hook, right? But if you were to just go out fishing and have the hook there with no bait on it, are you going to be very successful? Like is said, is said fish going to be like, oh, that looks, that looks fancy. I'm going to bite down on that. No. What do you do? You hide the hook with some bait. Something delicious. Something that's attractive. Something that's desirable. Something that they would want. So you hide the hook in the bait, you throw it out there, and then hopefully you get somebody to come down and clamp down on it, and once you do it, what do you do? Yank it and reel it in. You got it hooked. That's Satan's game, guys. All throughout us, all around us, there's bait waiting for you to clamp down on it, and you don't quite realize how big the hook is waiting to catch you. Because that's how sin works, isn't it? It's almost, it will usher in the greatest satisfaction. You bite down on it, ah, I got it. But then it brings in the saddest losses because you realize, oh no, I've been hooked. I've been caught. Now I know I'm mixing metaphors here because Paul's talking about like catching them in a big net and I just use a fishing line, but I think the illustration fits. And this is what Paul is talking about here. That the world around us is ensnared and caught diabolically intoxicated by the evil one. And you know what? You know who else has been? Me and you. Before Christ entered into your life, called you to him, these verses are exactly your state before God. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm sad because I often think that sometimes that we forget the fact that we, you and I were just as ensnared, just as caught, just as hooked as the world around us. You see, it wasn't until God sent a soul winner to communicate the gospel truth to you and correctly, gently brought you to truth and understanding of the real thing. I can think back of some of the conversations that I had with people before I was a Christian, and it's laughable, the things that I thought. How silly. I look back on it now, I'm like, that's kind of embarrassing. But at the same time, we forget the fact that when Paul writes elsewhere, that we were dead on our trespasses and sins. We're following the prince and the power of the air. We forget that the world around us is intoxicated by this because we don't necessarily wrestle with flesh and blood, but we wrestle against the rulers and the authorities and the cosmic powers over this age. And so we don't quite remember the fact that it was God who had to be in his sovereignty sending truth tellers who were correctingly, patiently enduring with our silly ideas and our silly beliefs to communicate gospel truths over and over again, knowing that they, by that would be set free from them, right? Right? That God used truth from others to peel the scales off our eyes and free us from the entanglements of sin in which we were caught up in. We didn't swim out. We didn't cut ourselves free. Christ has come to set us free. We didn't do it ourselves. 
So I, I hope that we never take the posture of pride and we wanna belittle and demean those who are, don't know Jesus and have silly thoughts and beliefs about the world because they're all out there. But Paul's instruction for us this morning would be to correct with gentleness. Be faithful in telling truth, knowing that by doing so, God may grant them repentance, that they would come to the knowledge of the truth. You see, I'm so fearful that at times our language is filled with vitriol and anger and bitterness and contempt for others. And we forget the fact that they're ensnared. They don't realize it. They can't see that they're hooked up to something. I just think about the countless of loss in our community, in our kids' schools, and we get angry at them for being caught in something that they don't even realize. We, we forget the fact that it was God's kindness that came to us that led us to repentance. Isn't that what Paul tells us in Romans chapter four, verse two? He says, do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? And so Paul's just laying out for us that when God has sent us on this mission to go out, to make disciples, to engage in this world, we are gonna come face to face with opponents of the truth of the gospel. But we don't get in shouting matches and we don't get on online message forms and blast them back and forth. We don't ignore them, we correct, but with gentleness. Knowing that by God's grace, he uses those things at different times to free people from captivity of the lies that they believe, right? It says, God may grant them repentance. We can't force it. So when we correct others, when we share truth, we pray for them as we do it. God, would you give them the eyes to see the truth and the beauty of Christ? Would you show them that the folly and the waywardness of their ways will only lead them to destruction and doom and unhappiness? God, would you show them of just how much you're infinitely better and more worthy of our time, our energy, and our attention than anything else in this world? God, I know I couldn't have come to that by my own, so I thank you for revealing that to me and setting me free. I mean, isn't that the reason why we love singing that song, Amazing Grace, so much? My chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior has ransomed me. And like a flood, his mercy reigns. Unending love, amazing grace. Did you notice all the action that God did in that song? The only thing that was attributed to me was my chains. And I didn't even set myself free. He set me free. He's extended grace. He's poured out mercy. And yet when we interact with people who don't know Christ, we want to add more weight to their chains. We want to throw away their key. We want to shove them down. We want to push them down deeper. May it not be so what this passage says. May we be an individuals, servants of the Lord who have been set free be people who correct others with gentleness, praying that God would give them the gift of repentance. So if you're here today, this morning, and you wouldn't consider yourself a Christian, if you're exploring Christianity, if you're exploring what all this thing means, I just have a one question for you to consider. Are you feeling trapped? Are you, are you feeling captured, ensnared, the only way to be set free is not by trying harder or working harder or trying to do better. It's by acknowledging that we can't save ourselves and it has to be Christ that comes to set us free. So I'd ask you this morning to consider who Christ is and what he's done. And I, I truly believe that if you're here this morning and you wanna consider yourself a Christian, that is a perfect example of what that passage said in Romans 2, 4. God's kindness and patience leading you to repentance. Like there's any other day that you could have been brought to church, right? But he brought you here today for a very reason. To hear about how God accepts and receives repentant people. So repent. Flee from youthful desires. Pursue righteousness. Pursue faith. Pursue love. Pursue peace. Pursue the one who set you free. And if we're here today and we are Christians and we're wrestling with what we do from out of here, I want you to do what this passage calls you to do. Continue to flee youthful passions and pursue those things. 
but also wherever you go this week. See your words as an opportunity to correct gently. See your words as an opportunity to invite others into seeing the goodness of the God in whom you worship week in and week out.